Hey everyone, I'm Paul Pepis. I'm the director of the Oregon Humanities Center at the University of Oregon. I'm really pleased to welcome you all to this, uh, the third event in the OHC's uh, special series celebrating our 40th anniversary. Uh, for 40 years, the OHC has helped UO faculty and students do their research and create new classes through our fellowship programs has brought engaging scholars and speakers to Oregon as part of our annual lecture series, and has hosted events like this that highlight the groundbreaking research and scholarship of our colleagues in the humanities across the campus. Today's event is one in a series of talks, panels, and events planned over this academic year to commemorate and celebrate our 40th anniversary, events inspired by our theme, Humanities Matters. We mean our theme in two senses. First, we want to highlight the diverse matters that scholars and students in the humanities and the humanistic social sciences study, research, and teach. And second, we want to affirm that the humanities matter, that the materials we study, the skills we teach, and the knowledge we create are relevant, valuable, and necessary to our lives, communities, and polities. Like this one, most of the events we've planned uh, this year will feature UO humanities scholars who will discuss their areas of study and why the knowledge they produce matters. Uh, but, but before I turn to the introductions, I have several events, uh, several announcements. Uh, first, I want to offer the UO's territorial acknowledgement as is customary at uh, our events and at many events on campus. Uh, the University of Oregon is located on Kalapuya Ilahi, the traditional indigenous homeland of the Kalapuya people. Following treaties between 1851 and 1855, Kalapuya people were dispossessed of their indigenous homelands by the United States government and forcibly removed to the coast reservation in Western Oregon. Today, Kalapuya descendants are primarily citizens of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians, and they continue to make important contributions to our communities, to the U of O, to Oregon, and the world. In following the indigenous protocol of acknowledging the original people of the lands we occupy, we also extend our respect to the nine federally recognized indigenous nations of Oregon, the Burns Paiute Tribe, the Confederated Tribes of the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Siuslaw Indians, the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde, the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, the Coquel Indian Tribe, the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians, and the Klamath Tribes. We express our respect to the many more tribes who have ancestral connections to this territory, including the Chinook Indian Nation and the Fort McDermott Paiute and Shoshone tribes, as well as to all other displaced indigenous people who call this place we call Oregon home. Next, I wanna offer some thanks, as I usually do. The OHC has been able to thrive for 40 years largely because of the generosity of our many loyal friends and donors. We are especially gratified to our friends and uh, donors uh, this year for their support because their generosity has allowed us not only to meet our 40th anniversary fundraising goal of $40,000, but to surpass it by over $20,000. So thank you so much for that support. Uh, in that regard, I also want to thank um, Amy and Alex Haugland, who are here with us today, two of our most generous donors, who helped us kickstart our uh, uh, fundraiser with a wonderful matching gift. So thank you to the two of you as well. Um, we are so grateful to all of our friends and donors for your faith and financial support. We couldn't have done all that we have done over the past 40 years without that help. Uh, and finally, thanks to our collaborators in UO Libraries and especially in UO Media Services uh, for their incredible support, their use of this room, and uh, to uh, Media Services for uh, helping us to live stream and record this event, and also for all their help uh, doing the UO Today uh, uh, interview show that I do with them uh, pretty much weekly. Um, last but certainly not least, thanks to the OHC's incomparable uh, staff the greatest staff on campus, I always say, because it's true. Um, our associate director, Gina Turner, our program coordinator, Melissa Gustafson, 
uh, our communications coordinator and UO Today producer, Peg Frears Gearhart, and our wonderful student workers, Eliana Friedman and Wyatt Bean. So thank you to the staff in particular. Uh, so there's no doubt in my mind that uh, this afternoon's panel will offer an ideal demonstration of why the matters that humanist scholars study matter. As many of uh, you are doubtly, uh, doubtless aware, artificial intelligence is a field which combines computer science and robust data sets to enable uh, problem solving. The subfields of machine learning and deep learning are frequently mentioned in conjunction with AI. These disciplines are comprised of AI algorithms that seek to create systems which make predictions or classifications based on input uh, data. Over the years, AI has gone through many cycles of hype, but the advent and rapid proliferation of generative AI, that's artificial intelligence that can produce images and text like ChatGPT, seem to have marked a turning point. And for us in the academy, I remember uh, last November when ChatGPT arrived, it's like a bomb going off on campus. Um, uh, the applications for this technology are growing every day and the possibilities are continually revealed. Um, but as the hype around the use of AI has taken off, conversations around ethics have become increasingly important. AI-generated text, images, and videos can be used to mislead and skew the truth. Because algorithms are initially written by human beings, the beliefs, values, and assumptions of programmers are baked into the way the code is written, and AI picks up and replicates those biases. And because generative AI is trained on information from the web, no matter its sources or accuracy, tools like ChatGPT can just make things up. And I can tell you as a prof who's read papers, they just make stuff up. Um, and, and a lot of the stuff they say is just wrong or offensive or problematic. Um, the spread and commercialization of these technologies raise urgent issues. Issues of trust and democracy, safety and security, privacy, civil rights and civil liberties, intellectual property, among many others. Uh, these are issues that humanists are ideally equipped to address. So we hope this panel on artificial intelligence and the humanities can help us understand better the affordances and the limitations of AI so we can better address the pressing issues like the ones I've just mentioned. We're delighted and grateful to be joined this afternoon by three UO humanities scholars with expertise in the philosophy of AI, computation, digital humanities, information politics, and data ethics who will engage through perspectives rooted in the humanities the challenges that AI and other data-driven technologies increasingly present today. So let me introduce our panelists to you. Uh, first, uh, starting uh, as far away from me as possible, is uh, Ramona Alvarado, who is an assistant professor of philosophy and the data ethics coordinator here at the U of O. Uh, on this side is Maddie Burkert, associate professor of English, director of UO's minor in digital humanities, the interim director of UO's new media and culture certificate, and the principal investigator and project director for the London Stage Database. And in the center, Colin Koopman, professor of philosophy, author of How We Became Our Data, A Genealogy of the Informational Person, uh, the project lead of the Our Data Ourselves web project, and uh, Colin is currently writing an NEH-funded book project uh, that, which is uh, titled Data Equals. Um, we've asked each of our panelists to speak in response to our topic uh, from their particular perspecti perspectives and expertise for about 15 or 20 minutes. At that point, we'll open the floor uh, for questions for the panelists. So first, join me in welcoming our uh, distinguished panel. So um, let's start with Ramon.
All righty. Well, thank you very much for being here. I really appreciate it. This is a beautiful room to talk about artificial intelligence, or to talk about anything, really. Um, one of the things that I want to talk to you about today is that, you know, lately, especially since, like Paul mentioned, since November 2022, I've been super busy just talking about AI all over the place, right? I've been to um, auditoriums full of alumni and parents of students here. I've been to churches in the Whitaker for some reason, right? I've been to um, public libraries in Bend and Redmond, and soon I'll be in Portland talking about AI. And one of the things that I thought when I started giving these talks was that I need to demystify AI. A lot of people doesn't know, don't know how it works, what it does, its limitations, etc. But the more and more I've been giving these conversations and talking about AI and how it works, I started realizing that something else needed clarifying, something else needed demystifying. And it wasn't AI itself, it was actually our concerns with AI. Um, because there's so much confusion about what we should be worried about, right? And so this is kind of what I want to talk to you about. It. There's a lot of misguided concerns regarding AI. And I don't think that, that some of these concerns are completely um, missing the mark, but I think there's something beyond them and behind them that sometimes get, gets neglected, and that's what I want to talk to you about. So I'll give you a couple of examples, right? So, you know, I used to think that I had to demystify just images. It just looks at a gradient, right, a 3D graph of, you know, uh, values, mathematical values between darkness and light pixels, and then it analyzes it, and then it gives you uh, an idea of, of of what the machine looks at, right? So here you have the peaks and the, you have the valleys, you have all kinds of lakes around there, right? And this is the way that a machine looks at an image. Now, it doesn't really look at the image. All of those are just mathematical values in a graph, right? And this is why that kind of um, technology ultimately will make decisions like this one. This one is categorizing this animal right here <coughs> as a wolf. Not because of its now, not because of its fur, not because of its eyes, but because of the background pixelation of a picture. Because the majority of the pictures of wolves are taken with their snow, right? But the machine doesn't know what snow is. It just knows that there's going to be a lot less mathematical difference in the pixels in the background, right? So, of course, we can do the same thing with text, right? And we can see this is how the machine looks at text. It just looks at the mathematical distance between one word and the other one, one sentence and the other one, or even one letter and the other one, right? Now, of course, this is what I used to do, right? But then I started thinking, maybe we should talk about our worries with AI, our worries with technology. And it so turns out, that, you know, we've been worried about technology for a long, long time. Uh, these worries are not new. I'll just mention, for example, Socrates was wo really worried about writing, this new technology called writing, right? Now, the funny thing about how Plato describes Socrates being worried about writing is Socrates actually citing the Egyptians being worried about writing. Right? So there's this tale that Socrates uh, talks about where there's this demigod that invented this brand new thing that he's very proud of that goes to this real god and tells him, look at what I invented, this thing called technology. And then the real god just tells him, you're an idiot. You just destroyed humanity. Right? Why? Well, because now humanity won't be able to memorize things, won't be able to really learn things, etc., etc. Similarly, Socrates was worried about writing and what it was going to do to our memory, but also to our pursuit of truth, because for him, pursuit of truth happened in conversation. It was dialectical. And so if you write something down, you might be thinking that truth has been settled or that you have truth already, right? So again, he was worried. If we fast forward to, let's say, uh, Kierkegaard, right? Kierkegaard was worried about newspapers and what they were going to do to our sense of meaningful information. If you have a newspaper around the corner that tells you that something happened in India and that something happened next door, you're going to think that those two things are equally significant to your life. It's going to be flattening your idea of meaningfulness, right? Again, Kierkegaard was worried about this. And then fast forward Dreyfus in the early 90s saying, there's no way we'll ever have the possibility of an online education. That's just not possible. The internet cannot educate us, right? So that's Dreyfus in the 1990s, all of them philosophers. Now, here's the thing. I used to use these examples kind of to tell you, like, weren't they wrong? Right? It's like, look at them worried about writing. Look at the civilization we've, we build with that technology, right? Um, or look at the internet. 
Yes, Dreyfus was right to be worried about something, but look at what we have done in the last 30 years of the internet with it, right? But I think more and more recently, I've been starting to think perhaps they were right. Perhaps they were right about something, right? Perhaps they were right about the fact that we had to be worried about those technologies. But what exactly have we have to be worried about? That's the question that I'm pondering more recently, right? So I'll give you a couple of examples of, of the kinds of things that I'm worried about, right? So um, one of the things that these three examples or these five examples have, especially the one regarding writing and the one regarding newspapers and the one regarding the internet, was how focused or obsessed we have been with the media aspect of those technologies, right? That's very similar to the way we've been worried about AI in the last couple of years, right, or, or, or the last year and a half since November 2022. We look at the images that are generated, we look at the text that is generated, um, and we kind of forget that there's something beyond and above the text and the images that we can see. And so, you know, um, let me just give you a quick example. I'm trying to follow my notes here, but my notes don't make a lot of sense, so bear with me, right? So the first thing is that if you think about image generation, and you start thinking about what these technologies can do with text, you might have some reason to worry. Okay, where is this text gonna end up? Is it gonna be part of mis misinformation, right? What about the images? Well, are these images going to deceive us? Or are they gonna be perpetuating stereotypes, et cetera, et cetera? But what I wanna point out is that the technology behind how these images are created should be more worrisome for us in several ways, right? Because think about what these things can do with pixels, how they can manipulate pixels, and how they can manipulate text, words, letters, etc., and how we can see them. Now, that same technology is capable of manipulating all kinds of other data that is not visible, that is not even intelligible in terms of text, right? So if you think that this thing can draw a good picture of you, wait until you see what it can do with your health data, right? With your insurance data, with your credit score. And now, this last sentence that I say, wait until you see what it can do, is actually false because you won't be able to see it. And that's actually even more concerning than what we can see, right? So again, there's something very uh, interesting and important to focus on the sort of surface level user interface output of images. But we should be worried more about what, how it does that and what it can do with other kinds of, of data that is not the kind of data we're used to understanding, right? So I think this is where some of the, 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 um, some of the focus is, is a little bit misguided or at least is missing something very important in, in the background, right? So now the second thing is, um, you know, these ideas of, of bias and, and how machine learning and AI perpetuate biases and, you know, have unfair outcomes and all of those things. And again, I don't want to say that those things are not important at all. I think they are important. This, this is one of the reasons why a lot of us worry about it. But I want to say that they are also kind of just looking at the surface, right? First, first of all, um, we have to understand that when we are talking about bias, there isn't just one single kind of bias. And when we're talking about bias in AI, we should also not just be thinking about the bias that is in the data sets. A lot of people, when they think bias, um, they think, oh, it must be the data set, or it must be the world that is biased, and we're perpetuating that bias. But it turns out that in machine learning, bias can happen at different stages of the machine learning pipeline, right? You can have aggregation bias, or you can have something like evaluation bias, right? Where you start giving your machine learning algorithm a lot of incentives to just get really good at what it does well, but no incentives or actually punishments at doing the things that it does very badly. So then the machine is just gonna get really, really good at what it does well, and is going to completely neglect what it does badly. Where does this come out more directly? Think about facial recognition uh, AI, right? Where it gets really good at recognizing sort of fair skin tones, right? But it's completely terrible at recognizing darker skin tones. Why? Well, this is not just because of the data set that it was trained or tested against. It's also because the way it was, if the, the algorithms are evaluated, usually just give more points for the things that it gets right and less points 
or punishment for the things that he gets wrong. And so the machine starts just trying to guess as many times what is more likely to get it more points than what is more likely to get it less points. Okay, so that's one thing. But there's other things that I'm worried about that have relationship to bias, but that are a little bit deeper, at least from my understanding, especially cultural understanding, right? And it's, I, want, I want to just give you one example, right? So some of you, if you've been to my courses, all my talks have been, I've seen this picture, right? And I usually ask in a Jeopardy style what's wrong with this picture, right? I won't do that too much today. It's called algorithmic monoculture. Algorithmic monoculture, like monoculture in agriculture, just means that we started sort of sowing and then harvesting the same thing over and over and over. In that sense, we're kind of perpetuating the kinds of things that are already regular, that are normal, that are overrepresented in our data sets, etc. In this case, you probably, let me just ask actually, let me make it more dynamic. Can somebody just tell me, except the ones that already know what the answer is, can somebody just tell me What's wrong with this picture? And of course, it's, it's AI generated, so there's no mystery about that. Does anybody want to sort of just give it a try? Okay, I'll tell you then. It's the smile, right? Why is it the smile? So the prompt was, give me a picture of a warrior, a Native American warrior taking a selfie, or a group of Native American warriors taking a selfie. And of course the thing went immediately to what it recognizes, right, which is American smiles, because the internet and the databases are full of American smiles, American selfies, etc., etc., right? Whereas if you actually looked at the warrior posture or the warrior sort of solemnity of, 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 of people of those times or people of those cultural backgrounds, they don't look at all like that. Of course, there were several prompts um, considering Japanese um, warriors, right, Polynesian warriors, and the same kinds of faces kept popping up. Now, what do we want to say with this? Uh, well, I want to say, of course, we worry about bias, but we should also be worried about bias in, in, in a more deep, uh, in a deeper sense, right, about perpetuating algorithmic monoculture, where things start having a regression to the meh, that's kind of like we, we, what we talk about in, in machine learning, right? It's not a regression to the mean, it's a regression to the meh, the things that are just kind of like, you know, meh, meh, I guess so that's the only way I can say it. And I'm not saying that American smiles are meh, right? And we're actually over the top most of the time, um, but, but, um, there's something that is just not about bias, right? There's something clear. Now, the interesting thing here, and this is where I want to talk to you about mo uh, algorithmic monoculture, is that it goes in many different directions, right? So, for example, we might have, per we might be perpetuating our own sort of tiny little understandings or cultural understandings of our notions of ethics and our ethical concepts, right? So, for example, for some of us, fairness equals equality. And then, for some of us, that means equality of representation, of distribution, or output, mostly without regards to just the certs or ground truth, right? That's fine, we have this notion of equality, but now we're putting this notion of equality into computers, as if they should understand it, or as if they were self-evident, right? We also have the notion of diversity. Again, a very American notion of diversity is going to be very different from a, from a notion of diversity from elsewhere, right? And then the problem is that when we put these things into our machines, they're going to come up with really weird outputs. And just to make it this a little bit faster, look at what happened to Gemini last week, right? So Gemini was the, uh, it was, well, Gemini is a whole model from Google. They just released it, right? And one of the things that Google really wanted to get right was the notion of equal representation and diversity in image creation, right? Now, what happens when you type onto Gemini? Can you give me a picture of a Nazi soldier? But, of course, Gemini is going to say it has to be diverse and it has to have equal representation, right? And so you get a picture like that which is completely inaccurate. It's not just completely inaccurate, it's actually erasing the truth of the exclusivity of the Nazi regime, right? Similarly over here, here's a portrait of founding fathers. I wish, <laughs> right? I mean, wouldn't that be nice? But it's not, and in a sense, this notion of equality and diversity that is very ours, we're American, 
turns out in a global, in a multi-global machine learning system is going to be interpreted in a really strange way, right? It's, and, and again, it's going to perpetuate, again, these very common ideas without critical engagement, right? Okay, so the last thing I want to say uh, regarding ethics and AI and our concerns with the AI, besides the fact that we should be really careful about our notions of ethics, our notions of fairness, etc., is that ethics is not just about mitigating harms. If you read Aristotle, if you read the Stoics, if you read the humanities in general, right, you'll find out that ethics is a lot broader than just thinking about mitigating harms or being afraid of harms, right? If we take in consideration that we're a little bit of a... We're, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go off the ledge here. We're a species of troublemakers, not just, trouble, not just problem solvers, right? And if that's the case, then we need to imagine an ethics that is broader, an ethics that allows us to reimagine and imagine how we want to live with these technologies, now, not just how we want to resist them or how we want to be afraid of them. Anyway. Thank you very much. Tough act to follow. Thanks uh, for that fascinating talk, Ramon. Um, I want to start off, first of all, um, uh, thank you all for being here. I wanted to let you know that if you would like to be able to access my slides like on your own device to be able to read along um, with anything, uh, those are available at tinyurl.com slash OHC hyphen AI, or you can also scan the QR code. Um, that's up there, and uh, for things that I s only cite partially, the, the full citations are in the notes on the slides, so that would might be the uh, reason you would want to go look something up. Um, so I also want to express my gratitude. Um, you know, my thinking on the subject of AI uh, has been shaped by many people, conversations, and spaces on this campus, and so um, while I cannot fully audit the black box of my mind, uh, I can account for some of its training data, and I'm grateful to um, a lot of people for um, uh, the spaces and, and conversations, although, of course, none of these people are implied to endorse anything I'm about to say. Um, so in thinking about what it would mean to give a talk as part of a panel on AI and the humanities, I, uh, I, I really struggled to choose a single direction. So uh, the first place I went was AI and humanities research, right? I'm a digital humanities person. Let me talk about how AI might be able to contribute to or enhance my research. Um, so as Paul mentioned, I uh, have a project called the London Stage Database, which is uh, online at londonstagedatabase.uoregon.edu, so it's hosted here. Um, and it, remediates a, um, a, you know, a 1960s reference book. It's got um, basically, it's an 8,000 page reference series, so it's about 52,000 uh, nights at the theater in 18th century London, what plays were performed, the actors who were in them, that kind of thing. Um, really just, in many ways, a digital remediation of an existing way of thinking about and accessing knowledge, just sort of like 2.0, reference book 2.0. Um, but Expanding this and uh, really thinking about it in a, a more capacious way would involve uh, doing things at a scale that we haven't been able to do before, right? A uh, big problem I've been running into uh, as a researcher for at least, you know, for as long as I've been doing research in the 18th century is the problem of text recognition. Um, so we know that if you need to be able to uh, put a picture of a book page um, on your Canvas site, you want to run OCR, or optical character recognition, in your copy of Acrobat so that you can um, be able to co uh, copy and paste and have that text recognized. That's computer vision, right? That's a computer looking at a picture and saying, that picture looks like these words, right? Um, it's really 
just not good when the words on the page are 18th century typography or 18th century handwriting. Um, and so there's a technology, um, a new sort of uh, set of technologies for historical and archival handwriting recognition. Um, one tool I'm excited about is Transcribus, which lets you, oops, I didn't realize that had sound, oops, sorry. I feel so inspired, that's such an inspiring melody. <laughs> Boy, it just makes me want to subscribe. So, <laughs> but I mean, but you can see the basic uh, concept here is that you could take something in a historically specific handwriting in a 16th century secretary hand, right, from a court scribe, um, and, uh, and basically recognize it as easily as you can a uh, contemporary typography. So um, that's really exciting. Uh, that would be a kind of game changer, uh, really, for a lot of the kind of work I do, right? Um, like the Bentham project just has a, a model of Jeremy Bentham's handwriting. So now if it's in Jeremy Bentham's handwriting or something like it, uh, you can basically OCR it as easily as you could anything else. Um, so another cool thing, um, this is an AI generated image that um, you know a, a data storyteller wrote, uh, created as part of a, a competition that Nightingale Magazine ran using the London Stage Database. So Nightingale's the magazine of the Data Visualization Society. And um, so they, you know, since the fully open access data set, they've said, you know, here's the link, have at it, see what you can do with it. This person, I mean, the actual, you know, underlying analysis they ran is, is very simple. It's really just kind of the most performed titles and like the word counts of those titles. But they used that to train an AI image generator. Um, and so you get this really kind of fascinating artistic uh, representation of like the vibe of 18th century theater, right? Um, which I think captures, you know, mood and affect and, and aesthetics in a, in a little bit of a different way that then that could be communicated by showing someone like a list of play titles, right? So, um, you know, A Fast Day for the Martyrdom of Charles I, The Tempest, Feigned Innocence, uh, The Recruiting Officer, The Stratagem, um, The Beggar's Opera, The Conscious Lovers, Romeo and Juliet, The Recruiting Officer, Love in a Village, The School for Scandal, The Duenna, um, or you could show this image, right? <laughs> the Morning Bride, I think, is overrepresented in this image, but, um, but yeah, I mean, so I, there's cool things that um, I'm excited about. Um, but then on the other hand, you know, whenever I'm thinking about using these, uh, these tools, and don't get me wrong, I love being able to put natural language in and get regular expressions out, um, uh, there's real costs to the adoption of these um, of large language models, the you know chatbots. Um, the content is moderated, and the guardrails are created by humans, and um, those humans have very low-paying, low-status jobs, often very high educational levels, and they think they're sort of going to work in the tech industry, and then they end up in a dead-end job that basically they're cast as like damaged goods to be able to work in the kinds of jobs they thought they were going to be able to and in the meanwhile they experience an enormous amount of trauma um, and have very little support for that uh, as uh, um, having to you know sit there and read all of the horrific stuff that gets you know that the that the model puts out and get that gets guardrails put on it so that the consumer doesn't see that kind of horrific stuff right and then of course we're increasingly aware of the massive energy and water environmental costs of uh, you know, the data centers that are being built to keep up with the increased adoption of these technologies, right? So um, you know, I've started to think about you know, going to chat GPT for anything as like eating a steak or getting on an airplane. Like, is it worth what I'm doing? Like, this is a high cost activity. Um, okay, so <sighs> excited about the future of my research. Like, maybe not the, the only angle I could take for AI and the humanities, so let's try again. What about humanities perspectives on AI? We like to, we like to think about having a kind of unique perspective on, uh, on emerging technologies, right? Um, and we could think about the kind of commonplace of thinking about AI um, technologies as, as black boxes, right? As the, the algorithm, the whole point is that we're building things that we don't fully understand to do things that we don't know how to make something do, right? We need the emergent properties of the program. Like that's literally, these are problems we can't figure out how to hard code, right? Um, somehow these emergent properties come up with solutions. So the whole point is that you can't really audit it. That's sort of, uh, that's not like a bug, right? 
Um, so uh, when we have these sort of inputs that go into the black box and, um, and outputs come out and we try to sort of guess what might have happened inside of the, inside of the black box, um, it's just not the case that that's a really a, a new concern. So in studying the 18th century, um, uh, kind of as we're talking about, right, we can see these echoes throughout history of the concerns that we have. Um, and so in the, in the period I study, and my, my first book is about the rise of financialization and how that was represented in the theater, um, financialization represents a similar threat, right? It's uh, the creation of synthetic data that then does stuff in the world. It's the creation of a synthetic information object. Um, and that has a kind of obscure relationship to how, you know, to what its inputs were. Um, so, uh, you know, in terms of thinking about the black boxes of the 18th century, um, many people have pointed out the kind of prescience of this passage from Jonathan Swift's novel, Gulliver's Travels, from 1726. Um, you, you're probably, you probably think about Gulliver's Travels, you think about he goes to the land of the Lilliputians where everybody's tiny and he's a giant. He goes to Brobdignag where everybody's a giant and he's tiny um, and it's sort of satirizing like microscopes, right? And, uh, but the vastly underrated third book um, is the voyage to the floating island of Laputa, which is a satire of the sort of scientific societies of the time. And when he's on Laputa, um, he encounters an engine. Um, and the professor who invented this engine takes him for a demonstration. Um, and it uh, it's, talks about how um, all of the professor's pupils are standing around the sides of this giant 20-foot square wooden frame. Um, and there's all these little b bits of wood in the middle. Um, that are linked together by wires, and the bits of wood have little pieces of paper on them, and on the paper are all the words in the language in all of its sort of moods and declensions. Um, and then what they do is they, uh, they crank the handles to turn the bits of wood, and uh, the whole disposition of the words was entirely changed, says Gulliver. He then commanded six and thirty of the lads to read the several lines softly as they appeared upon the frame and where they found three or four words together that might make part of a sentence, they dictated to the four remaining boys who were the scribes. This work was repeated three or four times, and at every turn the engine was so contrived that the words shifted into new places as the square bits of wood moved upside down. So this is um, an early account of kind of a probabilistic <laughs> language model, right? Like, m mix stuff up, and when something emerges that looks pretty much close to the shape of language, uh, write it down, and then repeat the process, right? This is essentially kind of how ChatGPT works. Um, and what's the purpose of the engine? Well, the purpose is everyone knew how laborious the usual method is of attaining to arts and sciences, whereas by this contrivance, the most ignorant person at a reasonable charge and with little bodily labor might write books in philosophy, poetry, politics, law, mathematics, and theology without the least assistance from genius or study. <laughs> When we think about our concerns about AI in the classroom, right, and how it disrupts processes of teaching and learning, we talk about, um, you know, the desirable difficulty factor, right? We, like, you don't learn without struggle, right? You don't learn without labor. Um, knowledge is not information. Um, well, this is very much about the emphasis on labor, right? So this is, these concerns are nothing new. Um, and Roger Lund, back in 1998, wrote this great uh, article about how um, Swift and his contemporaries were re revolting against the rise of information culture. Um, and he, he talks about their uh, sort of allergy to a culture that now demanded complete, widely disseminated, rapidly updated, accessible, and useful forms of information. Um, that their hostility towards the index function, towards indices, right, towards bibliographies, towards prefaces, towards anything that would synthesize information and make it so you could index a piece of information quickly without having to go through the whole process of reading the whole thing and reckoning with it. That that index function, um, they were revolting against the reduction of knowledge itself to mere information. Uh, sort of um, Lund's title of his essay, The Eel of Science, comes from this quote from Pope's Dunciad, how prologues into prefaces decay, these to notes are frittered quite away, how index learning turns no student pale, um, that is, they're, they're, getting, they're getting their tans, they're getting outside, they're not stuck in their room studying, um, yet holds the eel of science by the tail. So he's also evoking, of course, like the kind of classical image of the Ouroboros, right, the snake eating its own tail. And this is also an image, the Ouroboros comes up again and again in our fears about AI, right? Um, so 
Uh, there was this, you know, this is just a kind of a popularization article from Popular Mechanics. A new study says AI is eating its own tail. Grab your popcorn. Um, uh, and, and it explains the concept of model collapse, um, which is the idea that as the internet becomes full of content generated by large language models, and then they feed on it, they feed on their own excrement, and then they, um, you know, and then they just are, you know, the model collapses, right? It no longer has a ground truth, um, is the idea. Okay, so model collapse, they, they feed on their own outputs until it's all outputs. And of course, that kind of scatological humor is, is a big deal for the 18th century writers like Swift, like Pope. Um, and you can see that same uh, concern here, um, thinking about problems of authorship, of adaptation, of derivative writing, and passing it off as your own um, in this advertisement for um, an, a play that, that the writer of this advertisement considered a bit too derivative. So um, last Tuesday at the theater in, in Drury Lane was acted a comedy called The Refusal or The Lady's Philosophy, which was stolen from a comedy lately acted in Lincoln's and Fields called No Fools Like Wit, which was stolen from a comedy called The Female Virtuosos, which was stolen from a comedy of Moliere called Les Femmes Savantes. Uh, such authors as this, Mr. Dennis says, are fed like hogs in Westphalia. One is tied to the tail of another, and the last feeds only upon the excrements of the rest, and therefore is generally, when full grown, no bigger than a pig. <laughs> right, so this kind of excremental imagination around synthetic information is nothing new. Um, and, you know, uh, we can think about all of this in the light of things like the Writers Guild contract, right, and large parts of that debate. Um, and, you know, the lengthy strike um, that means, you know, that for six months there was no new TV or whatever. Um, much of that revolved around AI and, and in the kind of provisional agreement, the Writers Guild announced like they were, you know, announced triumphantly. AI generated written material is not considered literary material. It's not considered source material. It's AI is not a writer. Writers can use AI, but AI cannot use or exploit writer's material. So very sort of like um, one directional, and this is something really important to companies like OpenAI. It's very important to them that AI be framed as a, as a tool to be used and that humans have ultimate responsibility for uh, the things that happen. Um, you have responsibility for the outputs. Okay, so is this just sort of like, you know, the death of the author all over again, right? Um, we're all authors now. According to my predictive model, this is the part where I say, so look, none of this is new. Um, my period of study offers unique insights into it, and so in, when I retire, my tenure line should be renewed um, because the 18th century will always be relevant. Mic drop. <laughs> but I want to, I, I don't feel satisfied with that as an angle either because um, as K Catherine McKittrick puts it in Dear Science, um, to do radical interdisciplinary work that changes the kinds of questions we ask is not just about reading outside our discipline, researching and using slices and terms from people we don't ordinarily read. It's about sharing ideas comprehensively and moving those ideas into new contexts and places. So one last time, rewind and try again. I want to think about AI and humanity. Um, okay, so this is a, a graphic kind of based on Blade Runner, the big evil corporation in Blade Runner. Um, uh, they had their motto, more human than human. They create these androids. Um, you don't know whether you are a replicant or not, right? That's the kind of premise of, of the Blade Runner films. And cyberpunk is a genre, essentially, right? Is an interrogation of the legacy of, of the question of the relationship between the mind and the body and the programmability of the human mind and whether we are, whether we are computers, right? And all of that, all of those questions. So, Cyberpunk, uh, I like to teach as a way of thinking about, um, you know, what makes us human and what's the history of people asking what makes us human. Um, when we compare ourselves to animals, we say it's our rationality that makes us human. When we compare ourselves to machines, we say it's our bodies, our emotions, our empathy, right? Um, we're very invested still in a Romantic era conceptualization of intersubjectivity um, as a normatively physiological response that um, signifies your moral and ethical virtue. Your ability to feel like crying when you're in the room with someone else crying means you're a good person and a human, right? So that's actually the premise of the voight kampf test that they use on the replicants in Blade Runner is like, uh, can, I get a ri can I make your pupils dilate when I say something upsetting, right? Can you have a normative physiological response to the intersubjective experience of empathy? Um, so, you know, what's a robot? 
in science fiction, and I love that the Oxford English Dictionary's first definition, this is 1A, or sorry, it's 2A, but 1, yeah, no, it's 1A. 1A, chiefly science fiction, like an intelligent artificial being typically made of metal and resembling in some way a human or other animal, a machine capable of automatically carrying out a complex series of movements, especially one that's programmable, um, and a term originally used in a Czech language play to refer to mass-produced workers assembled from artificially synthesized organic material. And that usage derived from a term for a Central European system of enslavement. So when we call a machine a robot, we are invoking um, the long history of denying personhood or intersubjectivity to any agent whose labor needs to be extracted and devalued. Uh, influentially in 1970, um, Moray <coughs> et al. Um, came up with this term, the uncanny valley, to describe the intersubjective experience of, um, of interacting with a robot that looked a little too close to being a person, right? So the idea was that how comfortable we are with like a kind of just, you know, a C-3PO is fine, right? A person is fine. If it's like C3, C3PO in a skin suit, we start to get the heebie-jeebies, right? So this was essentially saying if you're creating um, robots that have anything lifelike to them, just be sure they don't look too close to lifelike because people will get super creeped out. And I left one definition out. Um, robot, chiefly science fiction an intelligent artificial being typically made of metal and resembling in some way a human or other animal and figurative, a person who acts mechanically or without emotion. So again, emotion makes us human and those who don't uh, display emotion normatively are exploitable for their labor um, or devalued as less than human. Um, and so a performance of a normative physiological response that signifies a normative mind-body relationship um, is really what we take to mean human. Um, and, you know, I'm autistic, and autistic people like myself are often described as robots, right? That's actually a kind of very common uh, figuration. Um, autistic people often self-report physiologically overwhelming, painful experiences of empathy um, that lead to a physiological shutdown state that is read as aloofness, flatness, and a lack of empathy. So. People have started to talk about the um, response to autistic people as the uncanny valley. So I don't think what I'm really most interested in is whether or not AI is intelligent or sentient or a person or human. Um, what I want to know is what exactly it is we're invested in when we say that the humanities are about the human cultural record. Why must an other fit our narrow conception of the human to deserve to be taken seriously as an interlocutor with the power to transform us. Um, Emmanuel Levinas, you know, famously, his ethic of the other was that we could not stay within these models of, uh, of the other as, right? Um, that we couldn't just say, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, the light in me honors light in you, that to approach the other is to welcome the way that they are beyond your capacity to grasp, to own, to understand, to be willing to be taught. So I want then to sit with that and to suggest once more, drawing on McKittrick, that we think about the humanities not as who we are, or as she puts uh, in, a, in a different context, and I am decontextualizing her, but I took the other quotation uh, as permission to do so. So I'm moving ideas into new frames. Um, but uh, she says, think about not um, what we think we already know about our seemingly authentic selves, which I take here to mean what it is to be human, um, but she says that where we know from, rather than what we already know about our seemingly authentic selves, is a more generous and difficult political project. So I'd like to suggest, finally, that we think about the humanities, humanities or about the human not as who we are or what we know, um, but where we know from. Thank you.
Okay, AI in the humanities. Exciting topic. I'm bouncing inside right now. I have so much to share. I'm on research sabbatical. I spent most of fall term holed up in the library researching a new field of education technology called learning analytics, which deploys machine learning tools on enormous harvests of student data to deliver personalized education. This is a fascinating field, replete with its own societies. I would love to share some of that with you. I spent five days over the weekend at the 38th annual AAAI conference, Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, alongside 3,452 other attending registrants. This is mostly a CS conference, computer science conference. Fascinating peek at what's going on right now. I'd love to share some of that with you. But I want to take a different kind of approach today and I think wind myself into the neighborhood of where both Maddie and Ramon ended their talks. I sense convergence amongst sort of ending points for all three of us, though we're getting there in different ways in different directions. Perhaps this speaks to the richness of the humanities. My way of getting there is going to be a little more blunt. I don't have slides, but I thought I would do a very quick, this is not even a demo, I just want to have a backdrop of an interesting image to look at rather than blue screen of a data projector. So this is uh, Adobe Firefly, which is a text to image AI generator, machine learning generator. Um, so let's look at an image of a philosophy professor delivering a lecture to a group of colleagues and students in a library browsing room on the topic of AI in the humanities. I did test this this morning. Let's see if it's going to be slightly different. And there's the energy consumption cycling away. There we go. So this is your background image to look at. So one surely burning question today in the context of AI is, are machines intelligent? Can machines be intelligent? A common tendency within the humanities and elsewhere in our culture beyond academia is to simultaneously overrate human intelligence and underrate machine intelligence. We might call this the original critique of AI. I believe this critique is somewhat mistaken or somewhat misleading. I want to propose, just as a kind of experiment that you all follow me in for the next few minutes, a particular kind of approach to questions of intelligence, thought, and mind that in philosophy we refer to as deflationary. The basic point of a deflationary approach to anything is to take the air out of it, to deflate it, to take out the importance from it of, of what has been overinflated. So instead of looking at something like truth as capital T truth, instead of looking at something as an immutable essence or as part of the very fabric of reality itself, you can see that thing as a contingent and often frail human achievement. And once you adopt this kind of deflationary perspective on something, you're freed up to look at it in a different kind of way. It's important then to understand that deflationary approaches are not simplifications. Rather, deflationary approaches push us to grasp things in their full complexity. The contrast to deflationism is idealization. And idealization is that which simplifies. So I want to consider to or experiment with two related aspects of taking a deflationary approach to this question of are machines intelligent. One aspect is going to be more theoretical, the other is going to be more empirical, and I think they both converge on a single insight that I want to submit to you all today. So, first aspect. In asking our burning question, I believe that we frequently get ourselves lost in irrelevant distinctions. Frequently, the burning question of are machines intelligent intelligent is considered with respect to a distinction between that which is special or important about humans 
and that which is, well, not all that important or special about humans. So then we ask if machines share certain qualities that we take to be special about ourselves. We take intelligence, thought, reason, intuition, creativity to be special and important. So we want to know, do machines have these qualities too? But rather than beginning with the distinction between what is important about us and what is not important about us, I want to suggest that we begin instead with the distinction between what we humans can agree on and what we cannot. And when asking a question like, can machines exhibit human intelligence, the first question we need to figure out on this approach is whether we agree about criteria for the quality of human intelligence that is to be exhibited. Now, agreement about such things is, of course, not all or nothing. It's a gradient. It's a spectrum. I would also suggest that agreement about such things is not kind of a mere mental exercise in beliefs um, that we can sort of fashion around a seminar table, but it's agreement in practices, agreement in what Wittgenstein called forms of life. So taking this approach, I want to hypothesize that for any human capacity for which we have a high degree of agreement about criteria for detection, that it is in principle possible for humans to build a machine that can exhibit that quality or fulfill those criteria. That is a machine that can pass the agreed upon criterial test. By contrast, where we do not have agreed upon criteria for testing a capacity, then of course machines cannot exhibit those capacities. But, and this is the important point here, where we do not have agreement about a criterial test, not only is it not the case that machines aren't going to be able to exhibit those capacities, but it is also the case that we cannot reliably say when humans exhibit them either. This is kind of a tricky situation to find ourselves in with, with respect to concepts like intelligence. So one thought here is that the absence of an agreed upon criteria for a capacity probably indicates that we do not really know what it would mean for that capacity to be expressed by any kind of entity, human or machinic or animal, et cetera. Now, of course, as individuals thinking about these things in our heads, we might come to believe, well, I have a pretty good subjective sense of this particular capacity, even the absence of an agreed upon test. But I want to, this is the point I kind of want to emphasize here. As soon as we submit that subjective sense to rigorous intersubjective scrutiny, i.e. we talk about it with other people whom we care about, we'll find that we do not have a good test. So now step back from this approach. So if we, if we think of, of this approach of focusing on the distinction between what we agree on and what we don't agree on, then I think we get to the following conclusion. Machines can be said to exhibit intelligence, but they cannot be said to exhibit morality. And this is a function of agreement and disagreement. Machine intelligence is, of course, partially a function of machines, but it is also partly a function of our agreement about criteria for intelligence. We have widely agreed upon, not perfectly agreed upon, widely agreed upon criteria for intelligence in practice. We widely agree on humans exhibiting this capacity, and so we can widely agree on when machines exhibit it. Machine amorality, not machine immorality, but machine amorality, by contrast, um, is perhaps less a feature of the machines themselves and more a feature of, of persisting disagreement amongst ourselves about what morality requires, involves, implicates. And in many, but certainly not all cases, we have trouble agreeing about what counts as morality. What is the right moral action? What is the right thing to do here? Disagreement persists about hard cases of the moral status of human action. And by extension, it persists about machine behavior. So, all this said, my claim that machines can be said to exhibit intelligence but cannot be said to exhibit morality, this all might seem purely theoretical to you, especially to those of you who don't share um, the passion that some of us here have for highly theoretical philosophy. And I think it would be fair of you to ask for some kind of empirical motivation for these ideas. So let me try. Let me try now a second aspect of this deflationary approach that I want to ask you to experiment in with me for a little while. One way of pushing this approach of a deflationary approach into gripping things in their empirical complexity is by way of a philosophical methodology that will be widely known to those of you in the room here today who are fellow humanists, namely philosophical genealogy. One thing that an empirical genealogy helps us do is deflate our concepts. 
Again, rather than seeing these concepts as eternal and immutable truths, the deflationary approach prepares us to see the concepts as the fraught products of histories of human action and interaction. Again, genealogy. So consider now a brief, very brief sketch of a kind of deflationary genealogy of intelligence. For a longer pair of sketches, I would refer you to Stephen Jay Gould's classic, The Mismeasure of Man, and Derek Darby and John Rury's book, The Color of Mind. But here's just a quick sketch. So intelligence, as a robust concept, stabilized in the early 20th century, largely through the data-driven apparatus of intelligence testing that solidified in the US sometime between the 19-teens and the 1930s. This was due to the work of a wide team of psychometricians, at the helm of which was Stanford psychologist Lewis Terman. When we talk about intelligence in humans in any robust sense, and I should note here, I'm not saying we should do that, but if we do that, and we're implicitly already doing that when we say things that elevate human intelligence and refuse to attribute that human intelligence to machines. So anywhere where we're elevating human intelligence, we're already presupposing a sense of, a robust sense of intelligence in humans. And when we talk about intelligence in this robust sense, the kind of psychometric apparatus that Terman and his colleagues developed is surely a large part of what we have to be referring to. For this is the practical test that we have at our disposal for determining an entity's intelligence. Now, most of us, many of us, hopefully all of us, are well aware of the deeply unjust aspects of the long history of intelligence testing and its many social uses. Knowing this history, we can fulfill one aim of genealogy, which is to move beyond glib celebration. But genealogies are also equally impatient with moralistic denunciation. Intelligence testing is much more complicated than either simplification of celebration or denunciation can presume. For instance, well documented is that intelligence testing in many Western democracies played a pivotal role in the implementation of that truly stunning idea of free, universal public education. Any humanist on the left who believes in some form of socialized welfare ought to take seriously that the biggest welfare state project throughout much of the history of the United States has been its public education system. This public education system is far from perfect, but perfection is a silly standard by which to judge anything. Rather, we should judge the public education system by, for instance, a hypothetical exercise in comparing it to case of a hypothetical history, there's that blue screen. <laughs> Rather, we should judge the public education system against the comparator case of a hypothetical history in which it did not exist. And I find that counterfactual truly chilling. Now, this foray into the history of intelligence and education may seem like an aside, but let me bring it back now to AI and show you its relevance. The upshot of this kind of genealogical account that emphasizes the contingent history of our contemporary conception of intelligence puts us in a good position to recognize a few features of intelligence that are too often glossed over by those who are focused on distinguishing AI's limits from the special capacities of we presumably intelligent humans. Yes, human intelligence is important to us evolutionarily, socially, personally, but consider also that humans who exhibit high degrees of intelligence are not simply in virtue of that, in any reliable sense, automatically better than other humans who don't exhibit those same high degrees of intelligence on intelligence tests. Consider that high intelligence in humans is perfectly compatible with blatant moral cruelty. These and other unflattering features of intelligence are obvious as soon as anyone points them out, yet they are too often neglected in discussions of the possibility of artificial intelligence. And I think this kind of observation puts pressure on the standard criticisms of AI that we have all heard and which many of us here have ourselves issued at one point or another, perhaps in a frustrated moment 
worrying about AI taking over our jobs. But this standard criticism according to which learning machines are incapable of doing some of the most important things that we humans do. These machines cannot rise, we have argued, to the level of human intelligence. But my deflationary view of intelligence encourages a different approach. I don't want to say machines can't rise to this level. I want to say, let's lower the bar, which is, in fact, where the bar already historically is <laughs> with respect to ourselves. Computers can, we should be prepared to admit, cross the threshold of intelligence, at least so far as we can even establish such a threshold for computers or for humans. And this need not be scandalizing to we humans here in this room or elsewhere. Rather, it can be accepted as perfectly unsurprising that humans would, in the course of their history, contingently develop a cultural apparatus around something that they themselves strive for, namely human intelligence, and then devote themselves later on to developing another kind of cultural apparatus that strives to meet the bar set by that first apparatus. So consider now a simple test. Can a computer run up a high score on an intelligence test? If so, they have met one of the only objective measures we have for intelligence. You can Google the answer to that question. Don't chat GPT it, because chat GPT, of course, is non-vertical, which is to say it's not truth tracking, as any computer scientist will tell you. One reply to this kind of deflationary approach, of course, is to deny, the ob to, pardon me, to deny the objectivity of psychometric tests as a measure for cognitive attributes like intelligence. This is a path that many humanists choose to the consternation of their colleagues in the sciences. Of course, we humanists are free to throw out the objective measures produced by our colleagues across campus. But if we don't put in their place some other kind of objective measure, then I think what we're actually leaving ourselves with is just a loosey-goosey subjective sense of concepts like intelligence that we, by our own lights, place enormous importance in. The other possible option there, of course, is to not place any importance in concepts like intelligence. I don't necessarily have an argument about that, but I would point out that you can't possibly do that for all concepts. You can't place importance on no concept at least not pragmatically, not functionally. Yes, we can do it around the seminar table. Any philosopher worth their salt can poke their hole, can poke a hole in the grand theories, the paper tigers floated up by the philosophers throughout human history. But you know, what do we do in practice? What do we do when it's our kid being submitted to a test for an IEP or a track, a curricular track at the local public school? Do we wanna just say, oh yes, principal so-and-so, Let's go with your loosey-goosey subjective sense of my son or daughter's intelligence. You want something objective, something more objective. But you might redouble, okay, Colin. But isn't there something subjectively we feel to be mysterious in human thinking? To that I want to say maybe, but what do we do with that feeling? What do we do with this feeling that there's some subjective mystery about human intelligence? I don't want to deny my fellow humanists and other persons in the world their pleasure in indulging in the feeling of standing in awe at the indefinability of human achievement. If you feel that, then know that I am with you. I feel that too. I think indefinability is invaluable, non-negotiable for the pursuit of aesthetic bliss, which pursuit cannot possibly be gainsaid. However, the private pursuit of aesthetic bliss makes for awfully poor public policy, and by extension, ill-equipped policy for regulating technology. If we need such regulations, and I believe we need them very badly, and yesterday, then we should not dismiss the hard work of our colleagues in the natural sciences, here psychometricians, just because we impress ourselves at being able to come up with a dazzling counterexample. So rather than stick ourselves in the morass of trying to mount arguments on the basis of our subjective sense of things, the genealogical approach that I've been sketching is able to adopt, again, a deflationary attitude.
toward intelligence, both in humans and in machines. This approach puts humanists in a good position to objectively, in as, most, in as robust a sense of objective as we can get, which is not capital O objectivity, of course, on my account, but position to objectively because empirically and in conversation with the sciences understand and assess the state of things in the world as they have contingently evolved. I'm not saying this work is easy. It's extremely laborious and painstaking work, but we can enrich our understanding in this way. Now, these genealogical empirical considerations lead us toward a conclusion that I already reached above in taking that more, exploring that more theoretical aspect of a deflationary approach. And the gist of the conclusion in the empirical aspect too is that something like the conception of intelligence toward which our technologists are asking the machines to rise is not something that is automatically beneficial or good. Consider in, as an example those humans who are impressively intelligent moral monsters. Chess wizard Bobby Fischer played a more aesthetically beautiful game of chess than anyone in human history or in computer history. He was reported to have an IQ in the, 19, in, in the 180s. His public cruelty and bigotry after he disappeared from the international chess scene in the 1970s are well documented. And that, in short, is what we are asking our computers to become. They will dazzle their opponent on the chessboard with a beautiful combination in one moment, and in the very next moment, or actually at the very same time, predict that their opponent and their entire family are crime risks or credit risks on the basis of data that are a proxy for the race. And I offer this to you not as a deep revelation. This is exactly what we should expect, given what we already know of the lack of correlation between intelligence in any objective sense of the term and morality. So wrapping up here, for these and other reasons, I believe we need to take a very different kind of critical tack toward AI than the original critique that simply elevates what is special about the human above the machine. Rather than working ourselves up trying to prove to the world what AI cannot do, we need to focus our attention on what AI can do, almost certainly will do, and in many domains is already doing. What AI is doing happens to just be what we know how to make it do, which is also quite obviously that which we know how to make ourselves do. It is truly unknowable if we are in fact made in the image of our maker, or even if we have a maker at all. But where we are the makers, our creatures are invariably made in our image. Thank you. So um, f uh, we'll do Q&A now, but first I wanted to give the panelists the opportunity to ask each other any questions that they might have. You guys have any questions for each other? And you needn't, I just wanted to give you the opportunity. So yeah, thank you, Colin, for that. Um, well, thank you both for that. But I, I would just kind of like, I'm just going to capture that last moment and that last sentence that I really enjoyed and ask you something. So um, you said that, uh, you know, when it comes to us being the makers of something, when we make them, they're inevitably and necessarily in our image, right? That was your, your, your last point. And I'm wondering, uh, what about the idea that Bacon had that in fact we were so flawed and so limited that if we're going to do a science or if we're going to do a device, it better be not in our, in our image, right? Because things that are better than us because we're, we're flawed. And I think, I think it's a good empirical question, a very difficult empirical question, whether for any given instance of something we made, whether it surpasses us or not. I guess I'm laying my bets, given how you've put it, against this Baconian injunction, because I don't see how we move past our flaws by way of building machines. I think we move past our flaws 
by intensive processes of intersubjective self-reflection, and then we overcome that flaw, and then maybe we make a better machine because we no longer have that flaw. Mm. That's just off the top of my head. Yeah, thanks. Does any, anybody else have any questions for, or do you have any questions for each other? Any more questions? Okay, questions, and you'll have to bear with me since we only have one mic. The, the uh, University of Oregon has one mic in this room, so I will bring the mic to you, and then I will bring it back to them. Does anybody have any questions for the panel? Well, I know you do, but raise your hand, please. Uh, hi, uh, thank you all. Um, I just wanted to start by saying last time I was in this room was uh, for another talk about artificial intelligence. It was Catherine Malibu's talk about a year ago. And the reason I bring it up is because um, I noticed, Colin, uh, um, the sort of thrust of your argument uh, in many ways sort of like aligned with and ran counter to Catherine Malibu's sort of like dazzling speech. Um, she, uh, for those of you who weren't there, her so the, the fundamental point that she was making was that the sort of objective of, uh, sort of the objective measure of machine intelligence is actually conversely in our inability to instrumentalize uh, their functions. So like she pointed out how we find it hard to like get them to do the things that we want them to do, uh, or that um, you know, like if we if we give a little prompt, it'll give us bad answers, uh, and that sort of sign of resistance was also for her a sign of intelligence. Whereas for you, Colin, it seems like your objective of in intelligence is actually very much in our ability to use, detect, and uh, produce. Um, through artificial intelligence. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that contradiction um, and you know, just sort of dwell in that space. Thanks, Dev. That's a, that's a very challenging question. I like it. Um, yeah, so one few of one theory of continuity between artificial and human intelligence holds that the continuity is to be located, as it were, architecturally. So in the ways in which our brains are architected as continuous with or, um, what's the right term here, analogous to, in a f sort of full sense of analogy uh, to the way in which computer hardware or software is architected. Um, and you know, there's pretty good precedent for this view because Jeffrey Hinton and other so-called godfathers of AI, you know, I mean, their idea was neural networks, neural nets, and it's like modeled on the brain. So there's, I think, a lot going for this architectural analogy approach, and that's also part of maybe and also like the main thing that's behind Malibu's approach as I understand it. I, I don't take that approach and maybe that's where there's a fault line between her view, between that view and my view. Um, my view is more focused on looking at the history of the contingent evolution, the contingent historical development or genealogy as I called it of what we can say about ourselves and asking if we have good criteria for saying about ourselves the things that we want to say also about machines. And that you know, we should employ here something like a, a principle of symmetry in the sense that if we are wanting to ascribe something to the machine, we should take the same approach that we would take in ascribing it to ourselves. Um, you know, and now I'm saying this, maybe the difference is just that Malibu is better versed in neuroscience, whereas I'm better versed in psychometrics. So it just kind of depends like which side of the psych faculty are we hanging around. Because um, maybe if I knew as much about neuroscience and cognitive science as she does or our colleague Mark Johnson does, I would think that that kind of architectural approach has more going for it. Um, 
So yeah, I kind of hope that gets to, to part of your question. I know there was sort of another aspect to it, um, but maybe, yeah, let me just kind of leave it at that right now. I, I don't think of ethics or morality as subjective. I think about it as, unfortunately, subject to a much higher degree of disagreement. And I think it's a separate question whether that disagreement is due to like an inherent subjectivity of the subject matter. I, I, my intuition is no. Um, and it would be an interesting, you know, it's an interesting question. What, it, what is it due to? But, you know, I, I take it, I'll just kind of state it this way to be as quick as possible. I take it as a fact that there's a much higher degree of disagreement about moral matters than epistemic matters or matters of knowledge. And that's why we cannot reliably attribute morality to machines and oftentimes to ourselves. As we all know, when we're facing moral dilemmas that feel completely unsolvable in the way that epistemic dilemmas often do not feel. So I'll, I'll direct this to the whole panel. So Colin, you brought up uh, regulations, but I think each of you spoke to sort of different aspects of our relations with AI as people. And I wonder if you could share your thoughts on what that tells us, how we should regulate, and what history tells us about how we should continue to forward in managing this emergent thing we're building. Uh, I guess I'll take this. Um, I'm not sure exactly where whether we converge or not, but uh, my view is that I would have to say it's too early to talk about regulation, right? Uh, it's too early to know exactly what regulation would look like when it comes to these technologies. And so my uh, worry is that the same thing that happened with Gemini and diversity and fairness would happen with any kind of like notion of regulation that we might have, right? That it turns out to be a hammer when we need a chisel. And so uh, I, I see AI right now, of course, you know, with all its problems, so that's what I, yeah, that's what I research, um, as electricity was sometime in, you know, in the late 1800s or the, the mid 1800s and, and, and after that, where um, we're going to make mistakes and it's a strange new kind of uh, power that we've harnessed. But uh, to, to start thinking about regulation so fast right now, I think it spells trouble. That, so, and I'm saying this hesitantly. I'm just saying I personally have no idea what people mean when they say regulation. Uh, most of the regulations that I've seen uh, look really strange, right? So, for example, people want to regulate their use of their data, but it's not even clear that that data belongs to them and not to the corporations that put the platforms where that data could be created in the first place, right? So the difference between metadata and data is going to be super in, in important. The other thing is that, for example, with AI and digital products, they don't even have the same conditions of persistence as other artifacts, right? So with a chair, I can say that's my chair and you cannot take that chair and I can sort of claim property over it with a copy of a copy of a copy of a digital artifact. That's not so clear that it's mine or that I can claim property to it. So again, you know, just putting out there that even notions of privacy, notions of, of, of private ownership, uh, notions of, of, uh, of what we ought to do with these things are, are just not so very clear. And so I just want to say I'm, I'm very hesitant when we talk about regulations because I think we're kind of, um, we're in, in peril of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Policy is not my area of expertise, uh, but in the, the spirit of things that I think with the 18th century about, uh, and I, I, have to, I have to think about the problem of the um, enclosure and privatization of, right, like public and civic life. So uh, that's a, a acute concern to the 18th century writers I study. Um, and I, I really 
just think that if we're talking about regulation, we're talking from a kind of a presumption that government's gonna come in after the fact, after industry's already produced a thing and made money on it and capitalized it and then um, stick some Band-Aids on it to make it less harmful. Um, and that, that just, uh, you know, still fundamentally presumes that it's going to be first and foremost a, a project of you know, techno-capitalism, and I, I, I'd, I'd like to imagine uh, an alternative where, um, as with like public media and other kinds of things that are far from perfect, but offer a, a kind of model of something as a, a, a public good and subject to kind of public um, and civic considerations um, before uh, profit concerns. That was... Again, policy is not my area of expertise, but <laughs> that's my gut feeling. Let me just say two quick wonkish things. One is that at this conference I was at over the weekend, um, a couple of the CS philosophers of mind, computer science philosophers of mind presented, and one of them made a pitch for FDA style regulation of AI. And you know that's got to be on the right track when the people in the room who stand up and object to it vociferously were attendees from big tech companies. Um, so I, I, and I think, you know, AI does not break the political model of the administrative state by any means, and that's the model we have for regulation, so we better hope we can get something. The second point would just be this. AI is not deregulated right now. Deregulation is a fantasy. It's a myth. It's a myth pervaded by, among other people, Shoshana Zuboff. Uh, Jerry Burke, who's a professor of political science here at UO and is not in the room, unless he throws his hand up, turned me on to a great review of Zuboff's book, Zuboff wrote Surveillance Capitalism, if you've heard that term, by Amy Kapsitsky, who's a law professor at Yale, who's part of the law and economy group into which you would also lump Lena Kahn, who should be everybody's hero these days. She's the chair of the FTC. She's doing fantastic work at that agency. And Kapsinski makes the very deft argument that big tech and big data are not deregulated. They've in fact achieved levels of market capitalization previously unheard of in human history, including as you know, just 10 years ago, the idea of a trillion dollar corporation, and now Microsoft and Apple are $3 trillion market cap. They do this because of a highly regulated environment that they're able to and have found ways to exploit to their advantage. And Kapsinski points specifically to two areas of law, trade secret law and contract law. Enforced templatization of contracts vis-a-vis -vis small players in tech, let alone all of us who are subject to that whenever we just click through on the terms of service, and trade secret law. So there's already a regulatory environment in place. The question is always, how should we re-regulate, not deregulation versus regulation? And, and so in the spirit of that, then my answer is something like an FDA style approval process. Hi, my question is difficult to formulate, uh, but something that Maddie said about how we use the term intelligence to both um, say whether someone is a proper person or not. Um, and so that's what a lot of the intelligence tests in some ways give, I would call bad actors, the ability to say, well, you don't get to make your own decisions, you don't get to do uh, whatever, you don't function as a proper person in society because your intelligence is, according to our test, objectively too low for you to do that. So, hypothetically, if we did come up with an intelligence test for AI, do you think that AI will ever be um, seen as a proper person. Uh, I have no idea whether AI will be seen as a proper person. I think, though, that my my concern is largely with the sort of discourses around why that why that concept of personhood matters. It doesn't interrogate the the category of the human, um, 
sufficiently and and oh god I saw like a h horrific um, paper I think it was an AI society or AI in society last year it was, it was talking about how to tell if a uh, artificial general intelligence had emerged and that we don't have an objective test of that and it and and the, t the title of the paper was suffering toasters um, and so <laughs> if you talk about like deep sort of like your whole you know, whatever is showing. I feel like that um, title of that paper really shows um, the extent to which we seem to just need uh, to deny personhood and intersubjectivity. Um, like, it, it's just this kind of like, just gut thing with AI right now to sort of, um, to start from from that place of, of threat and uh, sort of denial of personhood. So um, I, I think, I have no idea what's going to happen, but I'm really interested in how we're framing the questions and how we're framing what we think could happen in the fantasies and the fears about what could happen. So I, I just wanted to support, point out that that's, some of us think that the Turing paper in which the imitation test comes out which is now called the Turing test, right, to see if something passes the level of intelligence, some machine. Some of us think that that paper is so badly written in, in an argumentative sense. It's actually beautifully written and it's, and it's real. And, and it's surprising because Turing, of course, was taking courses with Wittgenstein, was in conversations with von Neumann. So, I mean, it wasn't, it, the only explanation for this paper being bad in that sense is that he had other motives than proving the intelligence of the machines, right? And, one of those, so, you know, some of us have interpreted this as saying, one of the things that Turing was testing with the Turing test was not machine intelligence, but was our criteria for morality and for inclusion of morale, uh, you know, inclusion into our moral community. And so, you know, when you go through all of these tests to see whether the machine passes it, whether the machine passes it, whether the machine passes it, yes or no, what you're really testing is like, why do you want that test in the first place? Right? Who do you want to exclude besides the machines? Right? And if you start thinking sort of about the history of Turing himself, right? um, and how, how much of an outcast he was in the UK, even after having you know, uh, participated in war efforts and being a genius and all that stuff, how he was excluded from the moral community to the point of punishment. Right? And you can't help by thinking, it's like, that Turing test, that paper, was actually not about machines at all. It's about why we are so bent on excluding anything that doesn't look like us, right? So that doesn't answer your question, but I just wanted to give it a little bit of context where I think that question has been around for at least, you know, 70 years since that paper, definitely in Turing's mind since, you know, since um, a little bit longer than that. Sorry, that was what I was very poorly aiming at was the way that we use that to exclude people and sort of how are we going to include other people who do look like us in the very basic humanoid way if we're basically using machine learning to as a tool to exclude people. Other questions? Thank you. <clears throat> this question's for the whole panel, but I just had a question regarding, given the inaccuracy of Gemini as a model and generating that image of the Nazis, and like I guess in scoring these models, people generally have an idea of what the output should look like for these, uh, these large models. My question is, what's the line between political correctness, historical accuracy, and artistic liberty when trying to address these uh, sort of issues. Hi, yeah. I, I'm not gonna directly answer the question, but I'm gonna tell a, an anecdote. Um, so uh, one, of my, one of my hobbies when I'm bored, uh, just joking, I'm, I never have time to be bored, but one of my hobbies when I need a distraction is um, I just sort of like attempt to provoke uh, to the point where I hit a guardrail and then like figure out where the guardrails are for the output. And so um, 
I was, uh, I was teaching a class last spring where I was working with students on ideas of citational justice and auditing your bibliography and seeing how, uh, um, how many men and women and people of different backgrounds and nationalities and all of this, like who are you quoting, who are you citing? Um, and are you going to the source of ideas? Are you quoting them secondhand? All of these things. And, um, uh, you know, I was trying to write the script. Um, I found like an open source bit of code. I was trying to write, like kind of modify it to, to audit one of my bibliographies and I was just getting frustrated. And so I did the thing of like, just put it in natural language into chat GPT and have it do it because then I don't have to write the code. And um, I said, okay, can you, can you audit my bibliography for gender? Um, and it said, sure, right? Because it's got a probabilistic model of how likely this name is to be um, a woman or a man. Um, and so uh, it's got access to those dictionaries. And so it says, yeah, yeah, I can do that. Cool, cool, yeah, I'll do that. Um, so it returns my bibliography sorted into probably men, probably women, unsure. And then it says, and then I said, oh, cool, now do race. And it was like, oh, I can't do that. Race is complicated. And then I said, what, what makes gender less complicated, I'm curious. And it said, um, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Um, I shouldn't have said anything that I just said. None of that was right. Please pretend I didn't say any of that. <laughs> Which I think just really, like, um, you know, it, it, in my mind, I, I think about how we, you know, how we raise kids or how we enforce so social norms and social codes, and it's through this sort of negative reinforcement of like, nope, that was the bad, you shouldn't have done that, you shouldn't have done that, that wasn't good behavior, like whatever. Um, that's like how we're training these models, and that's how we're like hard coding these guardrails. It's like, okay, you know, it's not at the root, it's just like, don't do that thing you just did that was bad and that made someone angry. Um, and, and so I think about that often when I, <laughs> I just think that it's like, it's such a transparently bad way of, of addressing the underlying problems. And um, if anything, I think the, the, uh, the humor effect of specific examples of what a transparently bad approach it is um, could go a long way towards uh, getting us out of some of the kind of pat, uh, you know, debates over your freedom to say the thing that provokes the guardrail or the freedom of the model to, to create the, the problematic output. So let me leave the artistic creativity part of the triad that you raised to the side and just take up um, what you called the balance between political correctness and historical accuracy. And let me just say that, you know, I think part of what I'm trying to, what I'm arguing with what I said earlier is that we're much more likely to get one side of that. We're much more likely to get our machines to do well on one side of that than the other. Currently, LLMs are wildly, historically, and factually inaccurate. However, that's a very solvable problem, at least in domain-specific implementations. We've already seen our colleague, uh, Rebecca Hanley, in the law school demo to some of us, LexisNexis AI Assistant, which this is a for-sale product by one of the leading legal information sources, so you can be sure that it's not m inaccurately citing legal precedents. It might not be citing the right precedent, but it's certainly not hallucinating cases and this works well and this is you know we're like what like 16 months in and we've already got like a domain specific implementation in one of the like the most um, interesting and complicated areas of, of human language so you know I think you'll see um, domain after domain getting better and better at the accuracy issue though right now most of these systems are factually wildly inaccurate so much so that the calculator analogy is actually perfect calculators do not make assertions of the world and neither do large language models and it just kind of it looks like an assertion because it's a well-formed english sentence or well-formed sentence in any language but it's not an assertion about the world they're not trying to get the world right so, you know, I think the historical accuracy side is that'll get taken care of, not in a general sense, but again, domain-specific domain implementations. The, the other side, I mean, 
I'm, I'm dubious about that. I mean, even to, you know, there's already going to be disagreement over whether we call this an issue of political correctness or we call this an issue of moral inclusion, right? Like, already. Like, even in just, like, setting up the problem or asking the question, we're, like, in a space of deep disagreement that takes a lot, a lot of work and commitment and energy to even get like a couple steps in the right direction in very specific, not even like domain-wide, like sociological domain-wide context, but like specific institutional contexts. Things are just much more fraught, and there's just much a higher degree of persistence of moral disagreement there. And that's not me trying to be skeptical or like cheer this moral disagreement. It's me being a realist and sort of observing the fact of its persistence. Um, so I, you know, I wouldn't want to see it as a balance. I'd want to see it as sort of two separate, you know, goals that we might have for AI. And I think one of those goals is much more likely to be met sooner, the other much less likely to be met sooner, if at all. Though I'm not, I don't want to be total relativist about it. We can do better and worse, right? Um, for sure. Way in the back. Uh, thank you all for helping us think through uh, some of these issues. Uh, I want to bring back the conversation or bring up the topic because it's come up a little bit about digital capital and situating this in the context of digital capitalism. And this reminds me of sort of what's played out in the history of labor where you've had potentially labor saving technologies come in and it offers great promise to reduce the time that people, working people, have to spend uh, on the job, but what ends up ha happening is new ways of labor being subordinated um, to, to technology uh, and job loss. And I think that the history of that is that that job loss um, has been distant from people in academia or in certain fields, and now it's coming a little bit closer uh, to fields adjacent to academia. And so I just wonder if rather than thinking about this as a matter of regulation, re-regulation, uh, to bring it back as a, you know, a union contract has mentioned the possibility of worker control of um, you know, platform cooperativism as new models for thinking about how to balance the power of you know, rather than sort of having a replay of AI servicing um, in the interest of capital, uh, if, if anyone can respond to that. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have, I do not have a good, a good answer to this in terms of the question of, of like platform cooperativism. Um, the, the, the thing that kind of keeps me awake at night is the, um, you know, the arguments that are sort of analogizing this to the Cold War, right, proliferation, deterrence, like, I, we have to have the tech because otherwise the bad guys will have the tech, whatever, right? Um, and, you know, military industrial complex means the best way we have to create the, the things that give us the geopolitical advantage is to leverage, you know, what, you know, kind of industries are um, concentrated in, in our spheres of power, whatever. So um, I, would, I, I just like sort of um, constitutionally am allergic to those kinds of arguments, but, but then also I'm sort of terrified about the idea that we sort of create things as a, as a public good and then, uh, you know, a, a technological breakthrough happens and it's on GitHub and, you know, anybody can, can use it, right? It's like when 3D printing guns became possible or, right, all of these kinds of, um, all of these kinds of moves to wanna make things more open or more transparent or, or more shared um, and the sort of, uh, the fear of, um, well, what happens if we don't enclose them? So I think that in terms of um, pushing against the kind of um, the big tech control of the, um, the sort of latest and greatest. 
Um, I, I, I do kind of like the idea of platform cooperativism, but I also am, I don't know, like I'm kind of scared when I read about um, some of the potential ramifications of that, and I just don't know enough about it because I'm not, everybody's asking policy questions and I'm like a literature person. <laughs> So I, I'll, um, here's what I'll say. Uh, I'll, I just I'm puzzled by these um, sort of questions. Oh, I'm puzzled by these concerns. I understand where they come from. I understand what the Industrial Revolution uh, did, and and how many people saw that as a model of exploitation, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, it's just. This, I'm still sort of grappling with trying to understand why these gigantic worry, or why this worry is so gigantic. Like if I think, for example, of what made the telescope, the telescope, right, the scientific instrument we call the optic telescope, um, it was necessarily, or at least it, it was at the time, a history of putting money on it, right, and of people actually trying to invest on the telescope so that it could be the best possible thing available to humanity. And so in that sense, when I look at the history of the development of of uh, technology, it doesn't surprise me that there's money behind it or that it generates money. Um, it doesn't worry me either because I've seen it so many times throughout history, right? So for example, with, with the telescope itself, you know, um, Dutch person in its workshop invents it by accident, right? Uh, that wasn't enough to consider it scientific. Then Galileo hears about it and says, I'm gonna make it scientific by putting some theory behind it. That doesn't really get accepted as scientific. Kepler jumps in and says, I'm gonna help Galileo, right? And he, he devises one of the first sort of blind experiments where he has people looking at things and then drawing in the dark and then comparing what they saw to see if they saw something objective. That wasn't enough. It wasn't until the Academia del Cimento with Prince Leopold threw like a lot of money in saying, I'm, instead of deciding which one is the best uh, instrument or whether this is a scientific instrument or not, I'm gonna establish an institution and I'm going to throw so much money for you to decide.